Jesus, Jacob of Seruk's version of the Abgar legend. We extend our gratitude to Susan Ashbrook Harvey for presenting our guest speaker and His Excellency Elias Zaidan for sponsoring this online conference. Before we start, I would like to share with you the logistics of managing this talk. You may direct your questions to today's speaker only at the end of her presentation. To do so, click on the reactions icon under the video feed. When the small pop-up window opens, click on raise hand. I will, I will call on you in the order I see on my screen and I will request that you unmute yourself. Once unmuted, you may ask your question. Thank you, Susan, for joining us. The mic is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Armando. And I would first like to express on behalf of all of us who have been participating in the series and who are here today, our gratitude to His Excellency Bishop Elias Zaidan for sponsoring this series. And then to you, Armando, and to Robert Kitchen for your tireless to make these meetings such fruitful and inspiring occasions. It's really a wonderful gift to be part of this. It is my honor and delight today to introduce Gibson's Assistant Professor of Historical Theology at Abilene Christian University's Graduate School of Theology in Abilene, Texas. He comes for MPhil and DPhil degrees, both in Oriental Studies at the University of Oxford. There, her doctoral thesis focused on the development of the Feast of the Discovery of the Cross in Syrian Orthodox homilies and treatises. The project involved consideration of Christian Muslim interactions and polemics as well, topics of keen importance in our current historical moment in which she has been addressing in various conference papers and hopefully soon to be coming publications. She also worked quite a bit of time exploring and living with the Doctrina Adai as well as Jacob of Sarug's homily on the discovery of the cross. And when the opportunity to participate in this seminar came, it offered a great moment to explore more of Jacob's works. And um, Kelly has serendipitously, according to her, discovered how fond Jacob was of the legend of King Abgar of Edessa and the Apostle Adai. While this paper cannot cover all of the varied ways Jacob explored and applied the legend in his Mimre and letters, she hopes it will provide a good introduction. And I need to insert one small advertisement. I should note that Kelly has been very helpful as a steering committee member for the new Syriac Studies Program Unit in the Society of Biblical Literature. We started, our first representation was last fall. And we are grateful for her help and looking forward to this, in this year's sessions in San Antonio to her paper on John of Dara on the death of Jesus. But today, in the meantime, Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gibson for her presentation, The Friend of Jesus, Jacob of Sarug's version of the Abgar legend. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you so much for that um, introduction, uh, Susan. And thank you, um, Bob and Armando, for inviting me to take part in this really wonderful um, seminar series. Um, I was honored to be invited. And um, I found over the course of what was kind of a, an isolating year um, that Jacob became a bit of a friend. He made me laugh. He surprised me. He puzzled me. Sometimes he made me cringe. Um, and all of my very best friends do just the same thing for me. And it was nice to make a connection with someone across 1500 years that way. So I'm grateful. Um, and now let me, uh, I'll begin my paper. Um, the friend of Jesus, Jacob of Sarug's version of the Abgar legend. Legend has it that Abgar, king of Edessa, plagued by a chronic illness, hears rumors of a healer named Jesus in Jerusalem who can cure people without medicines. The king 
also hears about a plot against this healer. So he writes Jesus a letter, confessing him to be God, begging for healing, and inviting him to take refuge in Edessa. Jesus receives the letter and replies cordially. He praises Abgar for believing in him sight unseen, but declines the offer of hospitality for he has accomplished his earthly mission and now must descend to the Father. However, he promises to send one of his apostles to heal him and evangelize his city, and he blesses Edessa, saying that no enemy will ever rule over it again. As promised, the apostle Adai arrives in Edessa to heal and preach. The king and Edessa, the blessed city, gladly receive Adai and his message, becoming the first converts to Christ among the nations, or so the legend goes. This Abgar legend spread early and widely in late antiquity. Eusebius of Caesarea took, took it at face value and in his ecclesiastical history is our earliest textual witness to an older written tradition that's now lost. Modern historians have also not been entirely immune to the allure of the legend. And while none treats the Abgar legend as historical fact, um, many have assumed that Edessa played a central role in um, the spread of Syriac Christianity, even though our sources suggest that that growth was um, more complex. Uh, recently, David Taylor has argued that the Abgar legend, and particularly the primacy of Edessa, um, was a favored origin story of primarily one uh, Syriac community, the Syrian Orthodox. But that raises the question, if that's so, how and why did the Abgar legend come to prominence in Syrian Orthodox circles? In this paper, I argue that Jacob of Sarug played a pivotal role in the popularity of the Abgar legend among the Syrian Orthodox. First, I'll, I'll examine Jacob's place in the reception history of the legend, showing, I believe, that Jacob accessed the Abgar legend independently from either Eusebius or the Doctrina Adai. Um, next, I'll argue that Jacob's use of the Abgar legend in his letters directly influenced his contemporary, the author of the Chronicle of Pseudo Joshua the Stylite. And finally, I wanna draw out a few ways in which Jacob deployed the Abgar legend to shape Miaphysite identity. Um, in doing so, he uses rhetorical strategies like exemplarity and contrast with others the legend um, and other stories from uh, Edessa's Christian past offer exemplars of faithful orthodoxy for Jacob's audience to emulate. And the legend also prompts Jacob to contrast Edessa with other cities of either lesser or later faith. The Abgar legend appears with surprising frequency, at least it surprised me, in Jacob's corpus. Jacob devoted two mimre to the legend, one entitled On King Abgar and that letter he sent to Christ and the reply that our Lord made to him, which I'll just call On Abgar, and another on the apostle Adai when he came to Edessa and On Abgar, and I'll call this one On Adai for short. A third mimre on Edessa and Jerusalem picks up many themes introduced in On Abgar and On Adai and embellishes them. The Abgar legend also lurks in the background of Jacob's three homilies on Edessan martyrs, on Habib the martyr, on Shmona and Guria, and on Mar Sharbel. In two of his extant letters, letter 20 to the Edessans and letter 32 to Paul, Bishop of Edessa, Jacob leverages the Abgar legend to encourage and exhort lay people and clergy alike. Due to the limitation of time that we have this morning, um, my paper primarily focuses on the Mimre, on Abgar and on Adai, and on letter 20 to the Edessans, but I'll take some select examples from other works as well. So let's turn to Jacob and his place in the reception history of the Abgar legend. 
Um, I'm going to examine his place by comparison with um, the two earliest accounts of the Abgar legend that we have, Eusebius of Caesarea and the Syriac Doctrina Adidae. Um, a comparison between these texts and Jacob's Mimre suggests that Jacob had independent access to the Abgar legend. The similarities and differences between how Eusebius tells the Abgar legend and how the Doctrina Adi preserves it, those have been well documented elsewhere. So here I just wanna highlight the most salient points for comparison with Jacob's account of the legend. The first book of Eusebius of Caesarea's Ecclesiastical Histories, this is the first quarter of the fourth century, closes with Abgar's correspondence between Jesus, or with Jesus and Adai's mission to Edessa. Eusebius summarizes documents from Edessa city archives that he says he has, and he's about to give the contents in full. So here's his summary. Quote, the King Abgarus, who ruled with great glory, the nations beyond the Euphrates, being afflicted with a terrible disease, which was beyond the, the power of human skill to cure. When he heard of the name of Jesus and of his miracles, sent a message to him by courier and begged him to heal his disease. But Jesus did not at that time comply with his request, yet he deemed him worthy of a personal letter in which he said he would send one of his disciples to cure his disease, and at the same time, promised salvation to Abgar and all his house. Not long afterward, his promise was fulfilled, for after his resurrection from the dead and his ascent into heaven, Thomas, one of the 12 apostles, under divine impulse, sent Thaddeus, who was also numbered among the 70 disciples of Christ to Edessa as a preacher and evangelist of the teaching of Christ and all that our savior had promised received through him its fulfillment." End quote. Next, Eusebius excerpts um, in full Abgar in Jesus's letters and preserves an account of the apostle Thaddeus's mission to Edessa. And I should say Thaddeus and Adai seem to be variations on the same name. The early fifth century Doctrina Adai is based on the same tradition. But the author has woven in other traditional materials to the original story. At the outset, the Doctrina sets up the story by explaining how Abgar first heard of Christ. His emissaries are sent out on a diplomatic, diplomatic mission, and they hear rumors about this miracle worker in Jerusalem so that they make a detour. And during their stay in Jerusalem, they also hear about a plot against Jesus. They report to Abgar these matters, and that prompts Abgar to write his letter. The text of the Doctrinus letters is very similar to Eusebius's. And they're working in different languages, Greek and Syriac, but um, it's not word for word the same. Um, and this dif the small differences suggest that the author of the Doctrina is utilizing not the ecclesiastical history as a source, but a source that's common to them both. Um, the Doctrina includes the following items, which are notably absent from Eusebius's version. One, um, the blessing of Edessa at the end of Jesus's letter, quote, and your town shall be blessed and an enemy shall not have dominion over it ever again, end quote. Um, two, I've already mentioned this narrative frame around the letters and Adai's preaching. Um, and three, many other traditions, um, including a marked interest in holy objects that Eusebius doesn't share. So he mentions um, Hanan painting a portrait of Jesus and Queen Protoniki discovering the true cross. Eusebius's account reports that Abgar commanded the whole city to hear the apostles preaching, but he doesn't include the contents of the sermon. The doctrina supplies that content um, in contrast to Eusebius. And the rest of the doctrina after Adai's initial sermon is unique. The conversion of nobles, church building activities, Abgar writes further letters to other important rulers. Um, Adai gives a final address and he's, he dies and is buried. And then his successor Agai is martyred by one of Abgar's descendants. 
The next bishop of Edessa must receive ordination from the bishop of Antioch, whom the doctrina connects with Peter and Rome. And these unique pieces have no parallel in Eusebius, nor do they appear anywhere in Jacob's memory. So superficially, Jacob's account seems closer, at least in structure, to Eusebius than to the doctrina. He only includes the two parts that Eusebius and the doctrina share, the correspondence between Abgar and Jesus and the apostle Adai's preaching in Edessa. Jacob does not include many other details that appear in the doctrina. There's no protoniki discovering the cross. There's no image of Christ. The entire section of Adai's ministry in Edessa isn't present. Unlike the doctrina, Jacob is not preoccupied with Edessa's relationship with Rome. And Jacob muses about how Abgar knew about this plot to crucify Jesus, um, whereas, as we've seen, the, doc the doctrina handily explains it. <laughs> um, no emissaries uh, inform the king about the plot in Jacob's account. However, um, there are some turns of phrase in the letters between Abgar and Jesus that the doctrina and Jacob share. Um, but, are, but they're absent in Eusebius. In the Doctrina, Abgar says that he hears that Jesus heals, quote, by his very word, end quote. The phrase appears twice, but Eusebius's version just says that Jesus heals without drugs or herbs and doesn't mention Jesus's word. Um, in Jacob's memory, the power of Jesus's word to heal is an important theme. Like the Doctrina, in which Abgar says, quote, I worship you, and, quote, I have believed in you. Jacob lingers over Abgar's faith. So in Eusebius, those two phrases are absent. He says, Abgar says, you are the son of God, or God, um, but it's not quite as, um, quite as drawn out. Eusebius makes Jesus himself the author of the letter, uh, so Jesus is literate in Eusebius, while in uh, Jacob's homily and in the Doctrina, Jesus orally gives a response to um, Abgar's ambassador. Jacob and the Doctrina both record Jesus's promise regarding the city of Edessa that no enemy will ever rule over it again. Whereas Eusebius has the exchange of the letters take place prior to the crucifixion, Jesus says there, quote, I must first complete here all for which I was sent, end quote. In Jacob and the Doctrina, this seems to occur between the resurrection and the ascension. He says there, quote, that concerning which, which I was sent is henceforth completed, end quote. So it seems clear to me then that while Jacob's account of the Abgar legend um, in some ways is closest to the Doctrina Adai, particularly in the text of the, let, of the letters, he's not relying directly on the, on the Doctrina itself. Um, so Jacob ought to be considered an independent witness to the tradition underlying both Eusebius and the Doctrina Adai. Like the author of the Doctrina, Jacob has used artistic license in his account of Abgar and Adai. He adapts it to his characteristic meter he reflects on its meaning and theology in some striking new ways. Um, it would be futile to try to reconstruct the text of these letters or the account of Adai's preaching based on Jacob's memory. But I think the fact that he's accessing this independently gives some insight into how valuable Edessan Christianity's origin story was at this critical time of development for the Syrian Orthodox Church. Jacob's contemporaries who appealed to the Abgar legend, I think probably also could have had access to um, that legend independently from the Doctrina and Eusebius. Um, now I wanna switch gears just a little bit and uh, think about the Abgar legend in sixth century Miaphysite literature. Um, apart from the Doctrina Adai, it seems to me that the Abgar, left a pretty lim the Abgar legend left a pretty limited footprint 
in fifth century Syriac literature. Interest in the legend blossoms though among early sixth century Neophysites with Jacob of Sarug taking the lead. Two of Jacob's contemporaries who draw extensively on the Abgar legend are the anonymous authors of the Chronicle of Pseudo Joshua the Stylite, which I'll call Joshua the Stylite for shorthand. I know that's probably not the author's name, but I'm using that for the Chronicle. Um, and this was written in 506 to 507 CE. Um, and the Julian Romance, uh, likely written in the first quarter of the sixth century or thereabouts. Um, and here, I'm just gonna focus on Jacob's influence on Joshua the Stylite. Based on the witness of Joshua the Stylite, Jacob was likely the first of these three early sixth century authors to make productive use of the Abgar legend. So here's what the chronicler says, quote, the respected Jacob, the periodutus, who composed many memre on sections of the scriptures and sogiotho and songs on the time of the locust, did not neglect his duty at this time. He wrote letters of exhortation to all the cities, encouraging people to trust in divine salvation and not to flee, end quote. The placement of this aside in Joshua the Stylite, if it's accurate, dates Jacob's letters urging inhabitants of the cities not to flee to about 502 to 503 um, in the middle of the Persian uh, Byzantine War of 502 to 506. One of Jacob's letters, letter 20 to the Edessans, perfectly matches this description that the chronicler's given. And the Abgar legend is fundamental to the argument of that letter. Um, as this letter is, uh, it seems, the earliest of the sixth century text I've mentioned that use the Abgar legend, I, I think it's worth examining closely. In this letter, Jacob instruct, instructs his addressees on how to encourage the citizens of Edessa not to flee the city due to fear of the Persians. Jacob calls Jesus's promise to Abgar that no enemy will rule over Edessa a, quote, imperishable word of God, end quote. In his view, to flee the city is tantamount to believing that Jesus is a mere human being, not God, because God's words can't fail. He quotes Isaiah, quote, as the dew and rain come down from heaven and do not return there, so the word that comes out of my mouth shall be, and it will not return to me in vain unless it has done the things that I desire, end quote. On these grounds, Jacob contends, quote, from the word, the only begotten son of the father, a word went forth that no enemy shall rule over Edessa, and that word cannot return, just as rain cannot return to heaven, end quote. But here Jacob entertains an objection. In defense of fleeing the blessed city, those whom Jacob calls of little faith paraphrase Jeremiah 18, verses 7 to 10. Quote, God said in the prophet that if he speaks concerning a nation and a kingdom to uproot and break it down, to overthrow and destroy it, but the people repent from their evil, he'll turn back from them the evil that had been planned for them. And if suddenly he speaks concerning a people and a kingdom to build and plant it, but quote, someone does what is evil before me and won't listen to my voice, I'll turn back from him the good thing that I said I would do for him, end quote. So having cobbled together their theological defense, they conclude, so now we are afraid for perhaps something like this will happen to us. And because of our iniquity, the promise Christ gave to the believing Abgar will be rescinded, even though it's said to have been given in perpetuity, end quote. It seems likely to me that Jacob's letter has been written at the behest of local leaders who wish to know how to respond to this argument. And because the excuse given is Jacob's response comprises the rest of the letter. He argues that one might be able to parrot the words of scripture without understanding their meaning. He urges his readers to aim for understanding, and he tries to uh, model the application of this principle. It is true 
he, con he concedes that in scripture, God blesses or punishes people according to their obedience or lack thereof. In those cases, it could seem that what God has said will happen might change with new circumstances, such as when people sin. However, Jacob draws a firm line between threats of punishment or the enticements of blessings on the one hand and irrevocable divine promises on the other. God made promises to people like Abraham, David, and Noah on the basis of their faithfulness. And these promises cannot be broken. Such is the promise made to Abgar. Quote, God promised the believing King Abgar concerning his city that the enemy shall never rule over it. And the promise is firm. Just as the earth is protected from flooding by the promise to Noah, so Edessa is secure from the enemy because of the promise made to Abgar. For if Edessa is subdued by the enemy today, may God forbid, tomorrow we should expect the flood to break through and destroy all flesh on the face of the earth. End quote. Nevertheless, God didn't promise Noah that people wouldn't ever be punished, and Jacob warns the Christians of Edessa that while they should have no fear of a conquering enemy, God might punish them in other ways. The promise given to Abgar wasn't given in the context of a contract in which God attracts obedience through threats or blessings. Rather, Abgar, quote, believed even though he had not seen Christ. End quote. Since Jesus gave the promise because of Abgar's faith, the promise can't be abrogated by the disobedience of later generations. In closing, Jacob instructs his recipients to, quote, reprove those who flee, encourage those who remain, deter those who love the luxury of the spectacles of the theater, and urge everyone on in virtuous deeds, end quote. In this letter, Jacob has expressed certainty about two things. First, the promise Christ made to Abgar that no enemy will rule Edessa is unconditional. And second, God may still punish sin in other ways, so everyone should repent and practice virtue. Back to the author of the Chronicle of Pseudo Joshua the Stylite. That chronicler interprets the chaotic events of the Byzantine Persian War through precisely the same lens. In the preface, the chronicler addresses his patron, who has asked him to catalog the afflictions of the recent past for the benefit of posterity, saying, quote, by means of writings, you wish to leave behind memorials of the punishments inflicted in our times on account of our sins, so that when they read and see what happened to us, they may guard against our sins and escape our punishments, end quote. The, the notion that catastrophic historical events are divine punishment and should be a catalyst for repentance is a really common theme in Syriac Chronicles. It's ubiquitous. But the chronicler goes beyond the patron's request by insisting that whatever punishments may come because of human sin, Christ's promise to preserve Edessa from the enemy's rule will remain firm. The blessing of Edessa is is also not an incidental theme to this chronicle. It's introduced early in the preface, and it really reaches a climax when the Persians fail in their attacks against the city. This chronicler was familiar with Jacob's letter to the Edessans prior to composing his account. So there's already good reason to believe that Jacob's perspective could have influenced him, but it's the unusual combination of punishment and repentance on the one hand and the irrevocable blessing of a death on the other that makes this influence even more likely. In his pastoral letters, Jacob of Sarug addressed a pressing um, social issue, and he did so first, and this argument became a valuable interpretive key for the author of the Chronicle of Pseudo Joshua the Stylite. Um, and now I want to turn one more time and consider Abgar and the shaping of Miaphysite identity in Jacob of Sarug's memory. Um, so here I'll draw out examples of how Jacob attempted to shape Miaphysite identity by retelling the Abgar legend. 
using rhetorical strategies of exemplarity in contrast with others. He presents Abgar as an exemplar of faithful orthodoxy whom his audience can emulate. And the legend also prompts Jacob to distinguish Edessa and those who would associate themselves with Edessa from rivals, particularly though not exclusively the Jews. So exemplarity, Abgar as a model of faith. In Jacob's memory on Abgar and on Adai, he presents Abgar as a model of simple faith in terms of how he came to believe and also the content of his faith. Echoing the legend, Jacob calls Abgar, quote, a great believer who, although he had not seen the son of God, knew who he is and whose son he is and what his place is. Jacob emphasizes how Abgar's faith came through hearing, not through sight. Quote, by the hearing of the ear, faith germinated and entered, and a door opened in Abgar's soul, and he saw lights. His thoughts were enlightened, and he looked forth and perceived spiritually the son who mightily performs miracles by his word. He saw him and recognized him. And although he didn't physically see him, he considered him, for faith is accustomed to search out hidden things. The man was enlightened by the movement of divine love, and although he was far away, he drew near to Christ and saw his light, end quote. Jacob contrasts Abgar's faith with those nearby in Jerusalem who witnessed Jesus's miracles, yet did not believe. Unlike the quote-unquote scribes of the people, Abgar has not had the opportunity to pour over the scriptures. In Jacob's version of Jesus's letter, Jesus himself highlights this contrast, quote, those who know the scriptures do not recognize me, but because your will loves me, you recognize me, end quote. Abgar simply hears about the signs and believes not only that Jesus was able to do such things, but that he is God and the son of God. The Mimro on Edessa and Jerusalem repeats this theme, quote, without instruction, without precepts, without parables, without an explanation, Abgar believed in the son of God, end quote. Jacob urges his audience to emulate Abgar's simplicity of faith, quote, therefore, it's necessary for everyone to enter that great gate of faith through which Abgar entered without prying, end quote. Abgar's faith is made bold by love. And in Jacob's view, that is better than much inquiry. Despite Jacob's appeal to imitate Abgar's simple faith, he subtly acknowledges some theological problems raised by Abgar's story. While Abgar has declared that Jesus is God, some aspects of his letter seem to belie that statement. For one thing, writing a letter is an act of familiarity between friends, patrons, and clients. Is it not presumptuous then for a human to write a letter to God? More troubling still are the, implication, the implicit uh, assumptions about Jesus. If one reads between the lines, it seems that Abgar believes that Jesus is limited in terms of knowledge, power, and space. If Jesus is God, he must be omniscient. So a letter revealing Abgar's illness or thoughts or a plot against Jesus, these are super, superfluous. If he's omnipotent, why invite the Son of God to flee from Jerusalem and take shelter in Edessa as if he cannot defend himself against his enemies? And surely it is a category error to assume that God can be contained in a physical place, whether in Jerusalem or Edessa. Jacob handles these problems ably. He's set them up to knock them down. Abgar's faith is not just simple. It's also prudent, able to accept apparent contradictions without being scandalized. Rather than being presumptuous and making too little of the holiness of God, Abgar's letter demonstrates fervent love and faith. Jacob assures his audience that, quote, there is never a blemish in the deeds of love. In great love that is higher and exalted above error, a human being proceeded to write a letter to God, 
end quote. Even more, the correspondence showcases the humility and love of the incarnate son. Quote, the son of the rich one associated himself with the poor, and for their sake he lived according to their customs. He adopted the customs of humans when he lowered himself, so that he even received a letter according to the custom of our place, end quote. Above all, the legend's apparent implications of divine limitation actually serve to illustrate the paradox of the incarnation. Being omniscient, Jesus has no need of a letter to learn Abgar's thoughts or intentions, but the incarnate Lord receives what was sent with love in the same spirit of love. As for limitation of place, Jacob observes that this is perfectly compatible with Orthodox teaching. Quote, while Abgar knew that the Son of God cannot be confined, he reasoned that the bonds of space held him because he willed it, end quote. After all, Jacob reasons, if a small womb was sufficient for God to grow in it, surely a small town was enough to honor him. He compares Abgar to Peter at the Transfiguration. They both offer a physical dwelling to God, whether it's a city or a booth, who cannot be contained. Their suggestions are a teaching opportunity. To Peter, Jesus says, quote, if you desire a booth, Simon, behold, I have one, clouds of light to receive me in which I may dwell, end quote. Jacob considers Jesus's response to Abgar along similar lines, quote, I am ascending to my father, the most high, Jesus sent to Abgar, for through this statement, Jesus made known to him where his place is, end quote. Perhaps the most important issue here is omnipotence. How can Agar believe that Jesus is God, but also invite him to flee his enemies as if he couldn't protect himself? For Jacob, this is the linchpin of truly orthodox faith, confessing that Jesus is God, even as one confesses his crucifixion. Abgar's faith is unimpeachable in this regard. Quote, Abgar believed in Christ, the son of God, and he even heard about him that they were crucifying him, and he did not doubt. He sent to him to flee, but he didn't doubt that he was God. He saw that they were crucifying him, but still believed that he was God. If his soul had not been full of faith, he would have thought, if he's God, he won't flee. This man, full of triumphs, affirmed two things, that he's the son of God and also that they will crucify him unless he flees. Abgar is thus absolved of the charge of insufficient faith. In fact, he demonstrates how to embrace the paradoxes of the incarnation. Quote, the mind of Abgar considered him, and his intellect was spiritual, and he was not spiritually disturbed by such matters. He did not reflect on his words that they were contradictory to one another, for he could not begin a disputation against the faith. With what he said, that Christ our Lord is God, was mixed another thing. They were also crucifying him and without wrongdoing, end quote. Jacob turns to praise Abgar directly, quote, from you, the peoples of the earth will learn the faith so that they may hope in the great way of crucifixion. Let your word go forth over thoughts and away with them, so that they may not doubt when they confess the crucified God. Let your faith become a light for our thoughts, which is not hindered by thoughts of division, end quote. Here Jacob insists that the people of Jesus will recognize him as God even in his death. Abgar, who can confess simultaneously Jesus's miracles and his suffering is a model miaphysite for one who's living in the midst of the Theopascite controversy. Um, in addition to exemplarity of setting up this exemplar of the faith, Jacob employs contrast to distinguish Edessa from other cities. The original Abgar legend evinced much animus against the Jews as for example, when King Abgar expresses his fervent desire to punish the Jews of Jerusalem for crucifying Jesus. 
Jacob's Mimre on Abgar, on Adai, and on Edessa and Jerusalem are likewise shot through with anti-Jewish material. More subtly, Jacob presents Edessa as the forerunner of all the, gen the other Gentile cities, which eventually turn to Christ. So Edessa is the first of many cities betrothed to Christ through baptism. While Edessa's primacy is not overtly developed in the Abgar legend, it's dramatically placed center stage in Jacob's memory. I've already mentioned how Jacob contrasts Abgar's simple faith by hearing with the lack of faith displayed by the scribes, the people who studied the scriptures and witnessed Jesus's ministry. His most striking variation on this theme is a retelling of Israel's history as one of divine courtship. God rescues the quote unquote daughter of the Hebrews from Egypt, woos her by sustaining her in the wilderness and establishes a formal engagement between her and the son at Sinai with the giving of the law. After the conquest of the Holy Land, she quote, came to Jerusalem, the bridal chamber of kings and the righteous, since there the father had purposed to gladden her with the brightness of his son. And the day finally came for the marriage banquet to be celebrated, end quote. The son at last comes to his betrothed, bringing healing and miracles as wedding gifts from his father's house. The bride accepts every gift, but rejects the giver. She flees the bridal chamber on the wedding night and plots to crucify the bridegroom. Here, Jacob casts Abgar as a matchmaker who arranges a marriage between the jilted bridegroom Christ and Abgar's daughter, Edessa. So Abgar's invitation to Jesus takes on quite a different tone. Quote, he wrote to the bridegroom, I have a daughter and she's very pretty. Take her for yourself, my Lord, to become yours with her companions, end quote. Uh, meanwhile, Edessa watches the daughter of the Hebrews flight with hope, quote, but the daughter of the Edessans desired Jerusalem's place, although she had not been invited. And she told herself, if she leaves, I will enter, end quote. Jacob envisions the city herself proposing to the bridegroom and Abgar's royal missive becomes a sultry love letter. Quote, the marriage feast is prepared for you, but the bride is angry at the banquet. If she does not wish to be accepted by you, take me and let her go. Look, that Hebrew woman is constructing a cross in order to crucify you, my Lord. Come to me and leave the barren woman who's not accepted you. Great is your feast that is prepared for the daughter of the Hebrews. And without asking for myself, I'm asking to enter instead of her. Draw me after you, son of the rich one, to the place of your father. With you, I will go, for your fragrance is sweeter than spices, end quote. But Jacob does not just contrast the believing Edessa with Jerusalem. He also emphasizes Edessa's primacy in comparison to other Christian cities. Abgar is, quote, a great apostle who had a crown and a king whose mouth was full of the gospel like the apostles, end quote. He anticipates the myth, and he anticipates the mission to the Gentiles even before the events of Pentecost. Abgar committed his city to Christ, even though, quote, the regions had not yet been set aside for apostleship and tongues of fire had not divided on all the disciples, end quote. The apostles, um, Jacob continues, were engaged to the cities by the Son of God, and they brought them to God by their teachings. Abgar gave his city without intermediaries, and he sent a letter before an apostle had come to him, end quote. In the Mimro on Edessa and Jerusalem, Edessa itself takes a similar role. Quote, Edessa opened the great gate for the cities that all of the peoples might become betrothed to the light that shone forth. Although it had not been sown, faith sprouted up from the city and it learned to speak the good news without apostles, end quote. 
So if Edessa and its apostle king learned the gospel without an apostolic intermediary, what about Adai's mission? In Jacob's version, Adai does arrive in Edessa and preaches, but he also states that Abgar's faith has no need of addition. However, in Jacob's hands, Adai's apostolic standing is enhanced. Jacob does not identify Adai as one of the 70 or 72, um, nor does the apostle Thomas send Adai in this account. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit directly endows Adai with fluency in Syriac, thus revealing where he's being sent. Though Abgar's faith was already sufficient, there is still something vital missing that the apostle supplies in Jacob's memory. The sacrament of baptism, which cleanses Edessa of idolatry and formally betroths the city to Christ. Quote, this apostle brought to Abgar that gift that his friend Jesus promised to send him. He's the one who came and brought baptism with him the washing of light to the bride who was darkened by idolatry. He is the scribe whom the bridegroom sent and who wrote the marriage agreement for her on whose behalf the king petitioned the son of God. This one opened the great door of baptism in Edessa, a town full of blessings for the ones who are discerning. This one brought glorious garments from the house of the father, and he washed and adorned the daughter of the Arameans since she was receptive. He purified, scoured, and polished she who had been defiled, the sweetheart of the bridegroom, when she was given to the bridegroom his lord. In conclusion, I've argued that Jacob of Sarug's creative adaptation and application of the Abgar legend contributed significantly to its popularity among the Syrian Orthodox, especially at the beginning of the sixth century. Jacob knew this legend without the mediation of Eusebius or the Doctrina Adai, and he's creati creatively applying it here. And it seems likely that his contemporaries and maybe successive generations also had access to that version rather than it being mediated through one of those other two. Jacob's contextual application of this tale already made an impact in his lifetime, as demonstrated by his influence on the basic theological orientation of the Chronicle of Pseudo-Joshua the Stylite. To Jacob, however, the Abgar legend was much more than just a, a reassuring promise about social stability in uncertain times. It was a powerful vehicle for shaping identity. In Abgar, Jacob sees a prudent, simple believer who's able to hold the apparent contradictions of the incarnation without doubt or division. In the final analysis, Abgar is simply a stand-in for his city, the daughter of Ar the Arameans. Um, and that city realizes, according to Jacob before any other, the great value of Christ, her bridegroom, and she breaks through the gate to make the way for the other cities to come in. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, for this excellent presentation. Um, to our participants on Zoom, you may now ask your questions. I kindly ask you to raise your virtual hand. Under the video feed, there is an icon called Reactions. If you click on it, a window will open up, and then you can raise your hand that way. Ryan. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you once again to you, Armando, and to Professor Kitchen and to Kelly for the talk, which was really interesting and very clear. So thank you. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first is, could you say something about Edessa uh, during the time of uh, St. Jacob of Sarag? Like at that point, would it have been completely Miaphysite and how would it have distinguished itself among other Syriac majority cities? And then secondly, I'm really curious if uh, Jacob does anything with, you know, the fact that there is this image of Jesus, which I think at his point would supposedly still be in Edessa. And not only like, you know, if this miraculous image still exists, but whether, you know, it, it might have any theological import. Uh, thanks so much and a great talk once again. 
Um, thanks for your question, Ryan. So I'm going to take them in the reverse order. Um, in the uh, memory and letters that I read in preparation for this talk, and, and it really was serendipitous, like I read one and then I'd find one more that I thought, oh, maybe I'll read this too. And so it was a really great adventure all the way through the, the year. In the ones that I read, there were no mentions of the image of Edessa. Um, that uh, I am not familiar enough with his massive corpus to know whether he uh, mentions it in other places, but I haven't, I haven't seen it in these. Um, in, in Edessa in um, the early sixth century, well, there were Persian and Byzantine wars back and forth. I do think that there's um, always some diversity of communities living in Edessa, um, but someone else may be better able to, um, to answer that question than I am today, so. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. Bob? Uh, yes. Um, good morning, Professor. Thank you for the talk. Um, according to the Maronite Synaxarium, this is the thing we still day. Happy letter of King Abdar to Christ Day. Um, <laughs> In seminary, we were told that only St. Ephraim elaborated the legend of the doctrine of Mareda. Your recounting of Jacob of Sarab's version is very surprising to me and very interesting. The scholarship of librarian Griffith, Professor Brock and Merkovich tells us that the text was not an account of Christianization of Odessa, but an exploration of the relationship between church and state. Question, what were the exact differences between the two versions? St. Ephraim's and Jacob of Sraab's in terms of church and state power. Are you saying that Jacob of Sraab believed that just laws can be derived not just from God and religion, but also from local culture, man's understanding, and geopolitics. Thank you again. Um, Bob, thanks so much for your for your question. Um, I had a little bit of a hard time hearing you, so I'm gonna respond to what I heard and hope that I'm doing you justice. Um, I am. I'm not aware of a place where uh, Saint Ephraim discusses the legend of Abgar, but someone could correct me on that point. I compared Jacob's with the Doctrina Adi, and also with Eusebius, and as you've mentioned, others, um, uh, Sebastian Brock and Alexander Merkovic, um, have already done um, really thorough studies on on those comparisons. Um, but um, so, and now I'm trying to I'm trying to remember what the second part of your question was. Um, I I get the impression that um, Jacob is not making a very big point uh, necessarily about inspiration from um, a local context, although he does seem to believe that. Abgar was in some way inspired in what he wrote, um, allegedly wrote to Jesus. Um, I do think he's, he, and, and what I, what I presented on today, I'd written like 
twice this and had to cut it down so we could talk about it today. So I left out lots of interesting things. He is really interested in, um, in political theology with the Abgar legend, but he's interested in so much more. Um, and it's almost like, you know, uh, Ephraim takes a pearl and he's sort of twisting it this way and that way and applying it in all different kinds of ways. And Jacob's doing that with this tradition. Um, it's, uh, I didn't even get to kind of touch on some of the exegetical um, approaches that he takes to the story comparisons with types and scripture and things like that. Um, so I, I can't, I actually can't like summarize what he's doing with it in a neat and tidy way because he does so much. Um, one, one thing I'd say, if you're interested in his uh, political theology with this, um, looking at his letter to um, Paul, the Bishop of Edessa, it's letter 32, and um, reading it alongside his martyrdom acts is, is pretty interesting. So his story is about the martyrdom of uh, Habib the deacon especially, but there are some subtle themes that flow through the act of, uh, or the, the martyrdom of Marsharbel um, and others, which I thought I found really fascinating for, for that kind of um, question. But he does kind of develop this idea that, um, that Jacob's a sort of apostle king, or not Jacob, that um, Abgar's a sort of apostle king because of his unique position. And that's really interesting. Um, so thank you so much. I don't, I hope I did justice to your question, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Susan? Maybe I could follow up on that um, point. And first, thank you, Kelly, for this wonderful and fascinating paper. I have a pile of things I'd like to ask you about, but I'll try to focus on one, uh, which I think is related to the question of a political theology. I've always thought that one of the most interesting things about the Doctrina Adai is its interest in the establishment, not of simply a faith in Jesus in Edessa, but the church as an institution. So you build church buildings, you ordain clergy, Adai lays down a law and the people of Edessa become benign, but not Kiyomo. There's an establishment of an entire ecclesiastical mm. structure in that text. And it's very interesting with the timing of that early fifth century, let's say, late fourth, early fifth, in terms of Edessa establishing its own um, authority in relation to other uh, Christian dioceses. So with Jacob's identification, this is very interesting, this last uh, example you used, the elevation of Adai, not as one of the 70 or 72 or sent by Thomas, but as one directly sent from Pentecost. And this identification of Edessa with the figure of the church, Edessa, the city with, this, with the bride, the church who becomes the bride of Christ. And so again, now thinking of that in the context of the early sixth century, the enhancement of Edessa as an, as an ecclesiastical authority, as a center of ecclesiastical authority, as a divinely established and protected center of it, seems to me also to have ramifications for how the bishops of Edessa are seen in relation to bishops of other cities. For example, the Bishop of Jerusalem or the mm -hmm. Bishop of Constantinople, if one is again thinking about your uh, very delicate point about the enhancing of Miaphysite, this building of a Miaphysite identity. I think there are ecclesiastical ramifications here in this elevation or identification of Edessa with church. Am I? Oh, yeah, I, I definitely think that's true. And I, I have to confess, I spent so much time reading one memory after another that um, I started putting this paper together and had a lot of unanswered questions. Mm -hmm. um, and so Ryan's question about Edessa in the sixth century, this question, what exactly is he trying to do um, ecclesiologically with this? Um, and I have some unanswered questions about that, which I hope to kind of shore up um, in the coming months. So, um, so 
I don't know, but if anybody has some suggestions or leads for me to pursue, then I'd love to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Ellie. Good morning and thank you. Uh, Ms. Gibson, this was very eloquent representation. Um, I'm going to take one just little bite, a shameless plug, I'm going to call it, to commend Father Armando for all the series. And I would say more than this, I would like to see spawning and uh, a number of series like this, even a symposium where we could meet annually for a long retreat and invite a lot of people, students, people preparing thesis, authors of all challenge and open. I want to go back to something you said that kind of held me in suspense the entire session until you at the end said, and have the city of uh, that that replacement of daughter of Zion would be the candidate and wanting and waiting at the door. It's the disposition of the faithful waiting at the door to be called in, right? Waiting at the door, begging to be called in with a hope. This is very, very ecumenical, very beautiful set, very beautifully said. It doesn't stand just only for that one city in my mind, but it stands for all the pagan cities of that time. It's a prophecy. In many ways, it advertises and proclaims the faith in many dimensions, not just for that one city, but for every sea that we see afterwards that's been established in the name of Christ. And that also um, emphasizes and opens one more thing. Christ is a lot more than just we, each one of us think is. The apostleship, the descriptions, Christ is not just a recipe of our own making or a recipe of a flavor that we prefer to. It is an exhortation to all Christians when we see pieces of literature like this come out and emerge out of nowhere. I had never heard and knew this much detail about the Apcar legend. And that is just one case in point. And in the Old Testament, there is something like this. When we see Jonah trying to go to Nineveh and he re reluctantly would go because he did not want them to be saved. And yet they were spared. And so there are a lot of parallel and continuity in the way the Lord talks to humanity to all of us, to each and every one of us. That was really two points of shameless plugs. One to say thank you, but another one is because you broaden my mind so much with the series, Father Armando, I beg you, I bid you to put on and launch with courage a lot more of these sort of series because it makes all of us, people who advocate this life in Christ to bring a lot of fresh blood and a lot of fresh views and bring it all together. I want to thank you both for this. And I want to challenge uh, Ms. Kelly Gibson and all of our speakers to yet some additional points beyond all of this is to, um, you, today you, you compared doctrinal differences in, in a way that really kind of forces our noses together as opposed to capitalize on differences. And I want to see a lot more of this happening. That's what makes my heart ache is all of these doctrinal differences that be separating the church. It is still one church. It is still one Christ. I, I want to thank you. I'll, I'll go off now. Father uh, Armando, I've, I've taken the privilege. It's not a question. It's really a, 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 a thank you. Thank you, Eli, for your kind words. Um, uh, we at the Merit Seminary, we have started a couple of years ago a, a series of talks for many for our clergy, but now we're opening it up for, um, for laity 
and we call it the Maronite Enrichment Days. And that normally happens the first week after Easter. So be on look up on lookout for for those talks um, um, next year uh, in, in, in the, uh, after Easter. Um, any other questions? Uh, if not, I would like to thank Kelly for when, again for your talk. And before we adjourn, I'd like to remind you that our next speaker is Aaron Butts. He will deliver his paper entitled A New Look at the Anti-Judaism of Jacob of Sarug. He will do that on Wednesday, September 15th, 2021. Another reminder, uh, a symposium in commemoration of the 15th centenary of St. Jacob of Sarug's death. That will take place on Saturday, December 4th, 2021 from 9.15 a.m. till 5 p.m. at Mar Afram Center in, in New Jersey. I would like to share with you uh, the program. So I'm going to upload it to the chat. Uh, if you click on your chat icon below the video feed, you'll be able to download it if you choose to do so. This is the program uh, for that symposium. And also Siri is uh, celebrating more Jacob of Saruk's 1500th death anniversary in Siri. Uh, I think the date is on September 14th, uh, 2021. Unfortunately, I don't have any website to share with you. Uh, I don't have any program to share with you on that event. Once again, thank you, Kelly, Susan, and all of you who joined us on Zoom, on YouTube, or on Facebook. And we will see you next time in September. Have a wonderful day.